Do you think it's important for the public to understand human evolution? How would you tell this story? How would you communicate it to your mother, your sister, your brother, different audiences? This is the challenge that science writers have. And science writing isn't one thing. It's a really diverse beast. If you work for a newspaper in a small town, you're going to cover science differently than if you work for a magazine, uh, a national magazine. If you write for television, you're going to cover science differently than you would do it if you wrote for NPR or a local radio station. If you wrote for USA Today, for example, their stories are something like six inches long. So those are going to be headlines from the frontiers of science. They can't go into a lot of detail. But if you write for The New Yorker, you can follow the scientists for months. You can do a profile of them. You can show the process of science. So the challenge for a science writer is to think about their audience. Now, I'm very lucky at science. I have a very smart readership. But we assume that the physicists don't necessarily know the difference between RNA and DNA or that the biologists don't necessarily know everything about the standard model of evolution. So you have to define your terms. But the good thing about writing for something like science is we get to show the process. And that's one of the real challenges to, to writers to do that well. So as Tim White said so well, science isn't this eureka moment where you scoop up a fossil from the back of a camel or you're in the lab by yourself and suddenly you know you've made the major Nobel Prize winning breakthrough. Science is false starts, wrong turns, it's messy, it's social, it's politics, it's disagreements. We need to show that process because that is how science is done, and yet it lurches forward. Science, there are incredible findings that come out of this very messy process. But then what do you do if you're a science writer like me and people take the disagreement and they blow it up and say, ah, scientists can't agree about the theory of evolution. Scientists can't agree about human evolution. Look, they disagree about this fossil. What I like to say, and I think is important as a writer to communicate, is there's disagreement about the details of how science works. There's disagreement about lots of details, <coughs> small aspects of it, but the broad strokes, there's tremendous breakthroughs on in the last 20 years. The fossils that he's brought back, the archaeology, the genetics have all come together to say, we're all Africans. We all came from Africa, and it was recent. We know where we came from, roughly. We know when we came out of Africa, when the first humans arose, from this convergence of data from all these different fields, not just anthropology. So when people talk about the theory of evolution, what's our job as a communicator to, sh to show how a theory is different than a half-baked idea? OK, this is a really important part of science writing, to communicate what goes into the process of science why that's different than from some quick half-baked idea. The other issue is balance. How do we balance what we write about? When we do our research, we may know that one side has a much stronger case than the other side, yet we need to tell both sides. So what is our role as science communicators in reflecting that? Global warming is a classic example. I think most researchers, some huge percentage, 98% or something like that, believe that the evidence is convincing that we're forcing our climate, that we're going through global climate change. But a small minority, their views can be represented as if it's half, as if it's a really substantial minority. And it's not. So how do we do that? How do we signal to readers that this is a minority view, that this is a major view? These are the important things that we debate as science writers. How to cover the complexities of science in an accurate and fair way. So those are the kinds of questions I want to bring up. You know, how to talk about theory, how to show how science works, but at the same time not get lost in the controversy, and how to communicate that, that to audiences that range from a USA Today reader who just glancing at a headline, somebody on the internet who doesn't really want to spend a lot of time at the website, to someone who wants to sit down and really enjoy the article. So you're writing to different layers. You know, who are you writing to? And then how you show the process, you need to go parachute in. I was lucky enough to get to go with Tim White to the Middle Awash and spend 10 days there writing about the process, the incredibly hard work in not only looking for the fossils, but organizing a team, taking them to a remote place without fresh water, keeping them healthy, keeping them happy enough that they can actually do the work. So the logistics are part of the story, aren't they? Who gets access to the data is part of the story. Who gets the permission to go to these places? So that's, that's what I wanted to communicate. It's a, it's a science is a process, and we try to show that in its complexity.
you want to kick that out to the audience and ask that? Because you, you first asked them, how, how would you tell this story how after you, what you've seen for the last day and a half, two days? Yeah, you heard the lectures. How would you tell this story? How would you communicate what you heard this morning from Tim or from Sarah from genetics? I think one of the most important things in relaying information onto people is acknowledging that the past is very much pertinent into our future and understanding where we come from and how we've evolved can aid in our potentials as a people. Um, so I think that point should be very made very clearly to any reader. Um, if there is no point to it, then there won't be any interest in it. And if there's no interest, then there's no learning. Over in front. Um, I think another really important thing is, like you were saying, definitions. So earlier there was a question about theory that Dr. White answered, and I think that that's a key point that needs to be said at the beginning so that people understand that a theory doesn't necessarily mean what high schoolers might view as a theory. Because that, if, if you think that something isn't well supported, you're less likely to pay attention to everything and take into consideration, wow, this is actually relevant. Wow, this is important. Because you need to understand that everything has a role in it, but you're not going to pay attention to that fact if you don't think that what you're talking about is serious. And then how do we do that in our stories? Charlie might want to talk about this. We're telling stories. How much of our story do we use to define theory? How much do we use to define terms? How much are we also competing with the sports stories, with every other story in the magazine or the newspaper, to keep the reader interested in evolution? And I think Charlie had some thoughts. I first want to thank Howard Hughes for organizing this, and particularly for bringing this audience together and mentioned audiences and the writer's awareness of it. Well, when I write a science story, and I've been doing it for 35, 40 years, it, you're the audience. And by that I mean I imagined myself in high school when I loved to read science stories. And I picked up the newspaper hoping to find one. And that's you. That's the, you're the sorts of kids that I want to write to, in addition to everyone else. The other person I write to is an editor. So as that's an editor who's going to sell the story to the managing editor and get it on the front page or in the magazine or on the website in a prominent place. So too, there's a practical audience, but there's the theoretical one and the abstract one, and that's, and that's you. The second thing, when you think about telling a story uh, uh, from science, I think the science writer actually has a great advantage over most other reporters because science is not the standard sort of news. Most news is bad news. Most news is about exceptions from the norm. People who have done something wrong or that sort of thing. It's crime, corruption, catastrophe, and celebrity scandals for the most part. A science writer gets to write about two things which are distinctive. One, the news is new to human experience. It's the purest sort of news. And second, it's a kind of good news you can find in the, what scientists have done in teams, and if you describe it well, you will, ex you will explain how the process works, that it's not stumbling across fossils, it's actually rather a rigorous and di diligent task. But more important, these are stories about smart people who did something right. It's about, it's about the, the, the nerds and geeks we knew in high school who we haven't heard from since, but some of them have become professors, and they're very good at what they do. Smart people who've done something right, you don't usually read about that until you read about someone in an obituary and you wish you'd heard and known about their lives before. Outside the sports section, I think there's no better place to go than to find portraits of people who, as I say, have done something exceptionally well and have made no mistakes, and that's the news. Um, but any other questions you, you may have, uh, 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 fire away, but again, it's just a great privilege to be here and to see the sorts of eyes I like to have looking at my stories. Uh, I'd just like to say something about how to present the information to the public. I actually did an internship at the National Cancer Institute on this subject and how um, the controversy over what age women should get screened for breast cancer, how the um, Annals of Internal Medicine changed the guidelines in 2009 and how the media presented it. What I learned with my mentor is that the most important things are to define terms and assume no prior knowledge, because you don't know who's going to pick up the newspaper and what they're going to know about any subject, and um, to 
um, say both sides of the argument because a lot of the articles we read were really one-sided and also to use examples and cite um, you know, people who are important in this issue like physicians or researchers or breast cancer survivors or just to make it relevant to the reader. You have to make it relevant or they won't want to read it. It has to be understandable. But then think about if you're writing for Science Magazine with readers that want to understand, how do these researchers know this? What's the method they used? What are the facts? What's the, what is the hypothesis that they're falsifying? You don't really sort of prove things. It's more you disprove things in science. So how does that fit? How do we know this? That's an important question. How is the case being made? So what we do at Science, I'm lucky, I have the time, it's a weekly. We do our own mini peer review, okay? I get a paper from Tim. I know he's good at his work, but I need to go find out if his colleagues agree with his findings. Sometimes it's based on reading the paper. <laughs> <laughs> Same with Sarah, I get some genetic evidence. Do other people think she did enough due diligence? Do we trust the data? So we do some peer review. Many, it's not real peer review. I know the difference. We get opinions, and then we decide who's credible. What opinions are worth putting in there? Do you see the subjectivity here? Who I pick to comment on an article? Who I pick, what they say, how much room I give them to comment on the article? The tone, how much balance I give? These are the ways we control how the information is perceived. And we really feel responsible. I feel it's an incredible hubris to profile people. It's an incredible hubris to try to get some of these incredibly complex stories right. I mean, I have 2 AM moments worrying about whether I've done it well and fairly. Charlie has a website he critiques the day of, the way we cover our science news. So science writers have a constant conversation. Did we cover that well? Did we cover that fairly? Did we blow it? And we do blow it sometimes. So that's a process as well. Yeah, go ahead. How do you fix those mistakes when you do blow it? Well, we run corrections if it's a, if it's a factual mistake. Um, always you should run a correction if you make a mistake. I mean, absolutely. You have to admit when you make a mistake. Often some of us fact check before our pieces go into print to try to get it closer to what is accurate. Different people might have different views about that. That's the other thing you're struggling with, how to reconcile different views of the data. Um, you also maybe do a follow-up story. Maybe you need to do a deeper story that puts it in context. Maybe on deadline writing a short story, you couldn't get into the complexities. If a large story comes out and there is non-factual information in it and it causes a stir, is there any way for you to go back and create a larger stir saying you were wrong and it was your fault? Or I'm not saying you personally, but because you've already made such a big mo uh, movement how do you stop that movement from just? I would say most of the time we don't make such blatant errors. That's not, I mean, there are errors. They're small, they're often small, but often it's that you are working with not all the data, okay? You're working, trying to put a story in context. We always have to say why a finding is significant. When he published Artipithecus, why was Artipithecus so important? It gave us the first glimpse of something that didn't look like a chimpanzee that could be more like the common ancestor we came from. It's a member of the human family closer to us than a chimpanzee. These were the important things to put in the story. That's why we care. That's why we need to write about this. What does it tell us about being a member of the human family? Okay? But when you first write, maybe there are only a few fossils out. So what's being said about it is not the final word. So it may be later that more information will come out. Or maybe you didn't get to as many people as you wanted to, or someone who had a really key insight that was important. So that's more the nature of the complexity for me at this point. Um, but there are issues with just basic, basic facts. I, I think covering evolution is very important that way because a lot of what we write gets taken out of context. People will use it willingly to say evolution is not proven. And I would say that's absolutely wrong. Evolution is a fact. I can show it to you as Tim can in the human family. You can show it in many animal families. We're not doing our job if we don't get that out there. There's debate about the details. There's debate about exactly when and where and whether Artie is exactly a hominid or is it something else. That's the process of science. If we didn't question the findings, science wouldn't be working. It's messy, it's social. There are biases that come in. But in the end, the, it's the best process we've got, right? It's the best process we've got. I don't know a better way to do it. Go ahead, yeah, I've got a question. Uh, uh, so this is more for the scientists, but when you, make, when you make a discovery and you've sent it off to the journals, what, what do you do to promote your views to the public instead of letting letting the natural course of journalism take its work and twisting your findings or anything like that? <laughs> uh, 
it's a really good question. You don't have to look very deeply to find the answer to it. And the answer is bottom line. Each scientist has a different agenda and a different value system. And so you'll find all different kinds of scientists. You'll find scientists that are more on the showmanship side of things. And you'll find scientists that are more on the, we don't want to talk to the media because they make a lot of mistakes covering our stories and we're just fed up with them. So there's this whole range of individuals out there. So what, what we try to do is, is to, and it's a difficult thing to do, especially when you've got a lot of pressure from colleagues and other places, the media included. We try to publish in the scientific literature knowing that there is coverage at all these different levels. And that coverage has evolved. There are good journalists out there. They're responsible journalists. They try to get the story. They will make the call. But what's increasingly happened, and it would be interesting to, to hear Charlie and Ann talk about this, is that there are fewer and fewer science journalists, and they're expected to stretch further and further. So they can't go into the kind of level of detail that, that Ann was able to do with the, with the RD paper. These are people who are on a deadline. They got a report on, uh, on, a, on a space launch and a genetic discovery and a fossil announcement all in the same day, and they've got to choose the and they So they're on a telephone for maybe five minutes, and then they run into all these problems that Anne runs into. What if they call the wrong person and get the wrong comment on this? Scientists, I don't think, should, should be involved in that. My, my role as a scientist is to tell other scientists what I've found, to put it out there in an accessible forum, let the scientific process work on it, but to go one more step. And the one more step is to make it accessible to people who are interested in it. So we ended up spending a very long time after the RD discovery, and actually during the RD discoveries, because, you know, like you, I'm sick of watching television where things are reenacted, right? I want my television to be reality television, real stuff, not some actor pretending, wow, look at, you know. I mean, we've got scientists who do that pretty well, and that's pretty pathetic to watch, because you can tell it's fake, right? <laughs> So we said to the filmmakers, 10 years before we even published, come onto the field, record the process. We're going to put this on videotape. That's why we ended up with the camera in the helicopter. That's why we ended up with them on the field site to show how this happens. That's real. That's believable. And we think that people can relate directly to that. And we think we have a responsibility to explain that to the public. Other scientists disagree. Other scientists say, we want to avoid that altogether. We don't want to make that. We, we don't care about the public. We only care about the science. And other ones say, hell with the science. Anything that works. I found the missing link. Hooray. Look at me. <laughs> you know? And uh, that looks fake, too. You can see those pictures, and you can sort those guys out. So I, I think you know, that, that commenting on the range, and I can recommend there's a two-hour show called Artie that uh, I believe is only aired once, is that right? Only aired only once. It's only been broadcast once, but it's a very fine documentary on, on, on Artie uh, made by the Discovery Channel in close cahoots with the scientists. And that in itself is a complex process of, of a long extended storytelling with uh, television producers and scientists working together. It's, uh, it's a big investment on both sides to, to try to tell the story. Do you want to add something, Sarah? Yeah, I wanted to comment from the geneticist's perspective, and I'll tell you exactly what it is that we would do typically when a, a paper hits, like science, for example. So I am always a bit cautious, I would say, because I am terrified that the journalist, not Anne, I don't have to worry about her, but because she also is writing for a science journal, so it's a different um, standard, I would say, than many of just the, the other types of media. I'm terrified they're gonna misinterpret it, and really scared they're going to say exactly the opposite thing. And it could almost be abused if it's really badly misinterpreted. I have had the exact same research show up on white supremacy websites. I have seen it shown up on sort of African roots websites, exactly the same research. And so you have to sort of give them, I think it's my obligation to give them some guidance. <laughs> and the best way to do that is that when my paper's coming out, and I know that it's actually accepted, it's going to come out, we work together, usually at the university, they'll have someone who does like public relations and media and communications, and they are trained as a writer. They are trained on how to communicate this to the general public. 
and they will typically interview us and write up a report or a press release that we would have some control over. I can make absolutely certain that they got the facts correct. And I'm basically gonna make sure that all the points that I think are critical are in that press release. Because often what's gonna happen, that exact press release is what's gonna go to the AP, and that's gonna go to all the different science writers, and they're probably gonna quote it exactly. So for me, you know, that's an important role. And then it also takes a lot of time, because if it's a big news story, you will get bombarded by phone calls, and you have to take the time, I believe, as a scientist to make sure they get it right. Because one of the biggest problems I've run into in my field generally is an oversimplification. They really like to say things like, we could show that this one man left Africa, you know, 30, 50 something thousand years ago, you know, and then they went to this area, and then they went to this area. No, we don't know that for sure. You know, we can make inferences. What are some of the limitations? What can or can't we infer? I try to get that point across as best as I can, but as, you know, someone else had said, it really depends also on the writer as well. It's important when you're thinking about this to realize that you're talking about three different spheres of activity. One of them is science, the other one is journalism, and the third one is entertainment. You know, with science, and I, I work in all three, um, with science, the important thing is get the facts straight. Make, them, make sure that there are minimum possible errors. There will be errors, but you want to minimize them. When you, as a scientist, enter the journalistic arena, there's different rules. What you're, usually what you're being asked is your opinion, your informed opinion to assist the journalists in pre presenting a, an accurate picture, but you're providing an opinion. The facts have already been provided. With entertainment, there are fewer rules. You know, the payback there is ratings. And so when I participate in entertainment, when I consult for television programs, when I cons consult for movies and documentaries, including these reenactments and things, the people who are genuinely trying to, pr pr to produce a nice product, something that will get good ratings, they, they want your advice, but they're the judge. They can accept it or reject it. So but often the lines get blurred. There, there is journalism that air, it slides into entertainment. There's entertainment that can be journalism and the science that is part of the journalistic enterprise. These are not completely different activities. They overlap and, they, and they, they bleed into one another if you're not careful. But when you're as a scientist, you have to figure out what's the environment in which I am right now. I'm in, I'm in a scientific environment, I'm in a journalistic environment, or am I in the entertainment environment? If I might I'd just add something to that. Um, Sarah mentioned the care that goes into press releases. And I track science stories written by journalists. And the and irony is that Generally, it's the second-rate stories, in my judgment, that quote the <coughs> press releases directly. But that's only because I think a properly written story is reported by the reporter, and he should call the researcher and use that press release as a tip sheet. The fact is that, that and, and not that the press releases aren't useful, because they are, because your generation has access to a diversity of scientific information, storytelling as well as the raw reports themselves that no other generation has had. And when I, most of my career, it was a rather orderly, if imperfect, process of press releases going to reporters who would decide what they were gonna cover, and then it would be in the major newspapers and the major broad, broadcast outlets and on the wire services. Now, those still exist. There are fewer people like Ann and me doing it, but they still exist. More important, a lot of scientists are blogging themselves directly from the field. You can find their, their sites easily enough. There are a million online sites which deliver press releases directly, which often have the most information, but the least balance in a sense. You, you don't get so many opinions from some other academic saying that our professor at the university of wherever is actually um, uh, wrong. You don't get that. But it, all those stories exist, and you get bloggers who often chew up and massacre the news. But it's a diversity, and it requires a lot from you, the readers, to find sources and sites you can trust. I mean, if you go to National Geographic or Scientific Americans or Science Now, that Science Magazine does, Science News, the AP, uh, New York Times, they're pretty darn good. Uh, but there are a lot of others that, uh, that may be superb, or they may be narrow, you don't know, but they're all trying to tell these stories. If, if I might finish, I want to ask Sean for his comments because uh, uh, Sean Carroll is, has a foot in each world. He writes regularly, intermittently, at long intervals, but expertly for the New York Times. And he also uh, therefore rubs elbows with a lot of the science journalists over 
at the Science Times, at the New York Times, and I might just ask, ask you whether you think science news is being delivered pretty well, crappy, you're the only one doing it right, or what? His style's very different. He just tells it, has an essay. He doesn't quote and have all this structure and other people's opinions like the reporters do, but they're great articles. What, how are we doing? Wow, that's a long answer, Charlie. Um, I think it's it's really variable. You know, that's that's all. The, if we were talking about any form of journalism right now, and you all would have your own opinions of where you like to go, where you think the information is is most engaging, is most informative, et cetera. It's the same is true for science. There are organizations that have really high standards um, and uh, have, have been in the game a long time, and there are organizations that are not aiming for the same. So it, as I mean, Anne made the mention of, of you know certain newspapers are going to have certain goals and certain limits, and, and others are not. What's happened? That what they keep referring to about fewer science writers, you know, the disappearance of, of daily newspapers is what they're referring to. Is that um, a, a lot of newspapers in various regions of the country had science sections, at least something devoted to science, maybe uh, one day of the week. And that's well, the reason we keep talking about the New York Times Science Times is probably it and what, maybe some from the Washington Post? That you, you might a, a few they're have pages. Here. They're usually on medicine and health. They're all health. Yeah, uh, no, that's not true. so much yeah. on basic research. Right, so, so we're, you know, we're talking about having shrunk to a, a population of one daily newspaper you know, with a lengthy uh, section devoted to science, which is how I wound up there. I, you know, I, I wanted to write a certain type of story um, I had fewer outlets that I could even contemplate um, placing those in. And I decided not to do what the other writers at the, at the New York Times have to do. I'm not following the news cycle whatsoever. Um, I am actually was trying to pick f stories that um, maybe never made a headline, but they only make, they're, they're a story that comes together when you look at a few pieces of science that have been done. Maybe all of them flew below the radar, but when you put them together, there's, there's a story there. Um, so since I didn't have that time pressure, I'm, I'm taking the luxury of just putting in my little bowl of fruit together from different um, orchards and, and writing stories on, on that. Um, I think that there's a wide perception that, that science on television, just to answer your question, Charlie, uh, has declined um, in substance and in value. Uh, and I think maybe that's a, a general comment about television in general, which is there's been a real change in taste and in, in style. You know, reality programs are cheap to produce, and somehow they've been, for lots of reasons, successful uh, economically. And, and you know, these are all for-profit organizations, so uh, they have to think about you know, what's going to pay the bills and employ their people. And so you see less money put into you know, costly drama, less money put into investigative journalism. You know, there used to be uh, a lot more primetime journalism that just didn't focus on celebrity murders. Um, and so uh, science does not occupy a lot of space in our culture. Serious science does not occupy a lot of space in our culture. And uh, those of us in the science and the educational world are concerned about that. Because it does actually play a big part in our lives. Our lifespan, our decisions, our big decisions, the fate of our, cult, you know, fate of our civilization. I don't think I'm overemphasizing that. But we're, we're going about it, you know, many of us feel um, at least half blind in terms of what we know and what the general public um, is in command of. Well, just to bring this back to evolution, one of the challenges for us is, you know, we live in a country where 40% of Americans think we were formed in this image in the last 6,000 years. That's the Gallup polls findings that's been consistent for the last 20 years. These are the people who vote and who get involved on school boards, choose textbooks, decide what you get in your science education, we're having fewer science writers to communicate these findings at a time when living in this, this country, in this world, is far more complex. When we're dealing with global warming, when we're dealing with evolution, we're dealing with evolving viruses, we're dealing with so many things that require this background knowledge. So that is one of the issues that we face as science writers. But one thing, too, that's important to keep in mind is, as much as I respect what Sarah, Sean, and Tim do, they're really excellent scientists. I'm not their PR agent either, right? And any scientist who thinks that, that's not our role. Our role is to represent the reader, OK? It's to tell you what we think is accurate through our filter, our subjective filter of whoever we are, to tell it as fairly as we can and as accurately. So that's why you don't just use the press release. You do your own reporting. You go to the places. 
You go to Denisova Cave in Siberia, that's what I got to do this summer, or you go to the field if you're invited and if you can possibly get there to see what is involved, okay? You try to really get your, you know, roll up your sleeves, get in there, do the science, observe it, spend time with the researchers so you really understand it. Do your homework, read the papers, you know, before you talk to them. Let's anyway, get some questions. questions yeah. here. Let's swing over here, here in the red. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, what do you do when you encounter people who intentionally misinterpret or just flat out don't believe what you're saying because of religious or cultural or just mispreconceptions? You do encounter, you do take that on. You do talk about religion. When I'm on a talk show promoting my book and someone says, how do you reconcile religion, the religious view with evolution? I'll say, well, the Vatican had a Congress in the 1960s. Even the Catholic Church concluded at that time that you can have evolutionary theory can be compatible with a belief in God. Now, you're not going to have a literal interpretation of the Old Testament. You know, you're not going to believe every detail literally. But people can come up with their own personal, th there is room for some personal belief, I believe. So I'll talk about that. But there's science is not the same as belief. You don't believe in the theory of evolution. It's been shown. There's a whole, as you saw the skulls Tim had lined up, right? That showed you something that's very hard to refute with evidence, okay? That we didn't look the same 6,000 years ago. But you don't, you don't, you know, there's a, sometimes journalists are accused of being educators right. and doing a bad job of it. <laughs> uh, but we're trying to tell stories and tell the news and explain what is different yesterday that wasn't true before or is new uh, and, and a surprise. But we're not educators. So if we, and our job is not to teach a topic, it is simply to reflect something which is new in the human conversation, some new event, something which is important. And so to be perfectly honest, even as science writers, we don't pay a whole lot of attention if readers call and tell us, well, this, this, this new discovery about the sun is, is bold because I happen to know the sun is a giant crystal powered by inverse gravity or something, and we don't pay much attention to that. Second, there is now, because of the web, a uh, rather large forum for people who object to the tone or the topic of a newspaper story, and these are the comments which are run online. And you look at most websites with most stories, and in blog sites as well, you will find these uh, flaming comments from people who uh, either have an ax to grind and they don't even pay attention to the story, or they're, they're, they're making an argument that is not very persuasive, or they may be correct, and you just have to be selective. And a good writer doesn't usually respond to the comments on their, on their stories unless the person is sort of within the realm of intelligent conversation, even if wrong and uh, civility helps. But, the, but the, the, the outliers and the contrarians certainly have plenty of voice. And uh, as just as one, speaking for myself, um, I don't spend a whole lot of time with them. And uh, if, but a fight, a real fight among scientists, people who disagree, that's news. And re reporters are guilty, in fact, of looking for conflicts and looking for fights and arguments and making things look contentious, because that organizes a story for you. If you have two um, legitimate points of view that are in debate in the public, uh, that will get exaggerated somewhat in news coverage as a matter of course, because one of those audience members is an editor. Editors like conflict. It's something they understand from police stories and sports stories and every other political stories. They understand conflict. And so the conflicts, rather than the collegial nature of science, I will, must confess, get exaggerated in the press in order to get the press in the press at all. Well, you, when your question asked about uh, how do we deal with someone who announces, I'm, you know, I'm, I don't believe in evolution, I don't believe that, you know, the Earth goes around the sun or some contrarian position like that. How, well, Science is a dialogue. When we publish our papers, we put the evidence out there, and it's, it's implicitly a, an invitation to our colleagues to comment or try to prove this wrong or to engage in a dialogue. But when you have someone who, who's for opening gambit and the, uh, the conversation is, I'm not going to, nothing you can say will convince me because of X, Y, and Z, then you as a scientist, you have to make a decision. Do you engage or do you disengage? Most, I think mostly scientists figure it's not worth the trouble. So most, most of the time, we, we just say, all right, 
I can't convince you, the conversation's over. There are lots of other people who are worth talking to. You're not one of them. Not you personally, but you know, somebody, <laughs> somebody walks onto the site and says, well, I, you know, this is 6,000 years old. It's, it's, it's you know, one and a half million years old enough. So. Way to go. But I think all this working scientists are educators. And um, so all of us have appointments at universities, all of us teach. Um, so we are interested that while the journalist, and, and Charlie described it, the journalist job as a, as a certain role, you would sort of say in the, in the communication cycle, but there's, you know, there's courses and textbooks, that body of knowledge, especially the body of knowledge that starts to distill out from the scientific conversation, really independent of the journalistic coverage. Um, what, what's in our classes, um, the materials that we may produce to be used by other teachers, that, you know, what you're likely to encounter in a, in a classroom has come from us, at not, new, not too many steps removed. Um, so we're hoping. It's, it's not, you know, there's certainly, you know, there's an element when you're in, you're in, when you're in the discovery business as a, as a research scientist, there's certainly this element of competition and there's element of, of uh, drive, you know, to discover something new. But in, in the education side, you know, you're, you're also part of this picture of, of, of moving society forward because the greatest thing about science is it's a cumulative body of knowledge. You know, once we know something, we don't generally unknow it. Okay, and so this, this body of knowledge keeps growing and keeps growing and growing, and it's our job to communicate that. And you know, we hope that that has traction on a much longer time scale than what journalists are concerned about. But, and just mentioned, the needle hasn't moved on the acceptance of evolution in this country for 30 years and for decades before that. Yet it has been, I would argue, the best 30 years in evolutionary science ever. So there's a disconnect between what we know, the massive growth of what we know, and what has either reached the people we've educated or the people who may have been educated before we, we could have reached them. Let's get some other people in the conversation. Um, do you think that the way science uh, was perceived previously and sometimes the way different advocates of science come up now has sort of still hurt the relationship between science and religion? I'll, I'll comment on yeah. it. I mean, yeah. It has to do with the history of um, the reception of Darwinism in America. Um, early on, people wonder why William Jennings Bryan was so fired up to prosecute the um, Scopes monkey trial. It's because um, around that time, people were, were using a perversion of Darwinian theory, a, a kind of social Darwinism, to justify eugenics to justify sterilizing poor people. And in, um, in German militarism, the rationale for World War I was, we're strong, they're weak, we're entitled to their land. And, th and when moral people saw that perversion of this evolutionary theory, they thought, this is, this is part of the baggage. If we accept evolutionary theory, then these other, other social justifications of bad things are justified. And that, that, that initial moral collision between Darwinian, a, a version of Darwinian theory, as I say, a perversion of Darwinian theory, and a moral, a moral um, America, that set the tone for some of the rejection of evolutionary theory and its more objective, non-social, socially prescriptive forms we see today. So that's just uh, academic jargon. But basically, we got a, a bad dose of, of, of evolution early on that put many people off of it. Rightly so, the, the version they were presented with. But the evolution of, of German militarism and the evolution of eugenics, that's not the evolution of today. But if science writers had done their job right, <laughs> and if schools had done their job right. Now, see, I disagree with Charlie a little bit. I know the old, the old saw, the old saying is that you shouldn't be an educator. But I do see my role as partly being an educator, getting the accurate information out, OK? Whether I'm lecturing or telling my stories, I think it's very important I just at a certain not level. Pedagogic. I mean, we're not there. But yes, of course. Yeah. People learn from news, and that's a form of education, but it's informal education. It's informal, and the story comes first, right. but Can I come back it's to important. This yeah. I, I think important. you've had uh, a really remarkable experience of, of, of stepping into two worlds. And I think uh, the value of that, especially if you can share that with, with more people, is to understand that I think in the media, and, and I'm just going to use capital M media, and we, we, won't, we won't pick on Ann or Charlie, um, there is this perception of a monolithic opposition to evolutionary science from all organized religion. Not true. And I have quibbled particularly with broadcast media in, the, in this country about this a lot. Because it, it, there's probably, I would say, 
The majority of Christian denominations have made their peace with evolutionary science. Some have not. They happen to be very vocal. They happen to be very politically um, active these days. But amazingly, you know, the largest denomination of, of, of Christians, Roman Catholics, have been teaching evolutionary science with no ifs, ands, or buts in their classes for more than 50 years. So, uh, and that's often news to people, especially maybe kids your age, if you haven't been exposed to some other way of thinking, serious religious people who have a different view of the science. Um, so I think somewhere the media has not done their job, and I know they haven't done their job, and this maybe goes back to the conflict thing, and it's, it's made me angry on many, many occasions, where uh, you'll see pitted on television, for example, um, a, a young earth creation of someone who thinks the earth is 6,000 years old, um, just pitted against you know, a, a, an evolutionary scientist for six minutes to just you know, talk past each other and then you know, what's new with the Michael Jackson trial. Um, you know, that's just not getting us anywhere. And I have begged producers, the people who decide who appears on television, I have begged them to put, for example, members of the clergy, theologians, on television who hold, this, who hold serious religious views but fully embrace the science. And I think if you were just to strike a cross section of America, I think that's actually uh, a big chunk of America holds faith to be important and would like to feel themselves to be scientifically in step. And I think particularly in the broadcast media, they have been an obstacle. They've undermined that possibility. I think there's, there's been a chance for a lot more uh, detente, let's say. Um, but instead, they like conflict, they like theater. So they pit people of totally opposite views against each other and, and ignore other voices. So over in the blue shirt. Um, as Back less and less Sorry. people are reading newspapers and magazines daily, have you changed your style of writing, I guess, for, for online, re online reporting? Because I know that people read an online article a lot different than they would sitting down at the breakfast table reading you know, the New York Times. So how has your writing changed? It's a great question. I worry about it. We write, we have two versions for science. I write my longer, more in-depth, more analytical pieces for the magazine. Those go to subscribers who are willing to spend, oh, at least $100 a year for a subscription. Great readership, but they can't get all the articles online easily. The online news is short because someone decided somewhere that people won't read longer pieces online. They're short. They're more superficial. We can't get into the complexities, and there's much more room for error. And so this is the direction we're moving in. I worry about it. I think there's great potential with internet science coverage, when you can embed video, when you can bring visuals, when you can have maybe a blog from a scientist involved. At its best, it's fantastic. But at the way it's being done most of the time now, there are tremendous inaccuracies. And it's, it's, I feel like we're losing the kind of more thoughtful coverage that had been in newspaper science sections, where features could be worked on. People could take more time. Um, even the news magazines, it's people a, are reading less. It, it's, it's a tr tremendous irony, too. Uh, when, when the web first entered the news business 10, 15 years ago, we expected that the long form news writing would go to the web because there's no limit on how many words you can put in there. There's no page columns or anything of the sort. And it's turned out to be just the opposite, that, that news has to be shorter. Attention spans are so brief on the web. People can click on buy if they're not in, instantly engaged. And, and uh, it, it's a problem. And the answer to your question is, yeah, you know, there's been adaptation in all ways. And there's all sorts of news. And, and, and Twitter, of all things, is considered a news medium now. And it, it is, but it, you know, when USA Today first came out, people made a joke, well, it's the home of the investigatory paragraph. And uh, it was. It was very short. And Twitter does the same thing. It does actually have enormous news value and tracking, shifting events. Um, and so there's been a tremendous adjustment. And plus the ability to put links into stories and other explanations uh, and, it, it, and, to, and to have multimedia with video and audio and all sorts of other media all mixed up together has made an enormous difference. It's very exciting to be a journalist right now and frightening. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was just wondering, Dr. Shea mentioned uh, morals of society. So how do you reconcile ethics and science together? Like, some people believe that it's morally unacceptable to study evolution because of their views or like use genetics 
to study it. So how do you reconcile, while doing your scientific research, the ethics portion and the science portion? Well, yeah, certainly I run into, there are a lot of ethical issues having to do with genetics uh, research, and it often has to do with the perspectives of the subjects, right? So there may be that Native American um, individuals may not want, they may be opposed to us doing this research. If they want, uh, they have their own mythology and they don't necessarily want us telling them what it is. And we, I think, have to respect that. I mean, ultimately, um, there has to be a dialogue. And what I've been, most of the scientists have said to me the key thing, and in my experience, has been education. If I explain to people really well what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, I find that there hasn't generally been the, the, the possibility of any uh, downstream problems is greatly reduced. So, and they can understand those, but at the same time, I have to respect them. If they don't want me to do it, or they're opposed, I'm not going to do it. So there has to be some boundaries at the same time. John and Tim can tell you, I mean, they have to, of course, deal with, with local issues, and, and we as American researchers, we have to deal with, with lots of regulations. I, they may not be, they reflect essentially society's ethics. So any research dealing with humans is very highly regulated, okay, any kind of human subject research, whether it's a psychological questionnaire or whether it's brain surgery, okay. Um, and animal research, the use of animal subjects is highly regulated. The use of recombinant DNA is regulated. The use of various other substances in the laboratory are regulated. And, this, and generally, that, all that has grown as, you know, right along in step with, with scientists' capabilities. Um, but as you know, some things, got into touchy waters, for example, stem cells. So uh, President Bush decided in 2001 that no federal money could be used to create new stem cell lines. So that was an executive order. Uh, it was not a piece of, it was not a piece of legislation, of congressional legislation. So that was an eight year long moratorium on the creation of new stem cell lines with, um, with federal money. It didn't stop private organizations from doing that, but it stopped any public money from being spent that way. So that reflected, you know, his view on what needed to be done. Um, and obviously other people had other views. So some of this is going to be hashed out, um, you know, whether it's in the legislative arena or the, the legal arena as society has starts to decide things. In, either in the U.S. or even other countries, there's been, you know, from the beginning of, for example, the birth control pill or in vitro fertilization, um, stem cells, there's a history to lots of things when technology was new that people did not accept it, you know, all at the same time. Um, there may have been more regulation on it earlier. There may have been places where it was rejected. It's interesting the United States adopted birth control um, pills a lot earlier, for example, than France. You might now have the impression that France is a, quote, more liberal country than the United States, but initially it was slower to adopt. So you do see quite a degree of heterogeneity across the world in terms of what are, you know, currently accepted practices. Um, just to give you a little flavor for that. I might add one thing. When we wrote about the sequencing of the Neanderthal genome, this was in Science about a year ago, we wrote a short story to go with it on, could somebody clone a Neanderthal? Is the technology there? Is it ethical? Obviously not ethical, but who might be doing this? This came up with the first with the mammoth genome. You know, somebody somewhere trying to do that. So, so good science writing will reflect that. Researchers will, will talk about it. Often the policies are not quite keeping up with science. So that is part of the political, social policy debate that has to happen. More hands than ever, which is what we love to see. So let's come back up here. Let's go all the way far in the back, right? Yes, in the red top, right? Oh, yeah. um, in the international scene, how much um, authority do you have as scientists over how your articles are translated into other languages? I mean, because the facts themselves can't really change, but I mean, for comments and things like that, when you're translating into another language, a lot of time the tone can change very subtly, which can change the whole impression someone gets from an article. So do you have any regulation? Um, do you get to review any of that? Or? No, I mean, I, I, I speak I'm, often yeah, with international yeah. reporters, and again, if they're doing the job properly, they're going to call me up on the phone, and they're going to ask me about this, but frankly, if I don't have good knowledge of the language, I'm not going to know if they got it right. Yeah. Uh, that's the reality. And, and I would just say styles are really different. You know, if you look at a German science magazine, a French science magazine, a British science magazine, American science magazine, Styles are different. What they're looking for, what they might emphasize, it's, it's definitely not just one journalism. 
That's just naming kind of the easy Western Europe comparisons. You, as a scientist, you really only have control over what you write. You know, so if I write an, an article in English, which I command more or less, um, that's my words. You know, if somebody translates it into, into Turkana, I have to trust that you know that they can put the subtleties and nuances into Turkana. I don't speak Turkana, so I have to just trust them. But they can lead you, you know, cause problems if they if they mistranslate it or willfully you know mistranslate it. But what can you do? You really only have control of your own words. In the turquoise. Um, how do you think media conglomeration has affected the portrayal of science news? Well, I'll take a crack at that because I read a lot of media. And it's bifurcated. We have two peaks. One is the atomization of information I talked about already with a hundred small outlets that do science news. I mean, there's Ars Technic and Gizmodo and Fizzorg and all, they have all sorts of strange names. But more insidious, until maybe this web revolution has undermined it, has been the concentration of control of the major news flows in fewer and fewer hands. We just heard that there are fewer newspapers. There aren't really fewer newspapers, but there are fewer newspaper employees. And those remaining newspapers, they tend to be in fewer and fewer chains. I mean, there's Media News and, and Hearst and uh, Scripps Howard, and uh, uh, not, not very many. And uh, Rupert Murdoch has recently uh, moved into many of the major newspapers in this country. His troubles with phone hacking in Britain may erode his empire, I don't know. But, but this is a, a concentration of news, and I think it's just unfortunate. Where the greatest deterioration has been, and uh, this is something Sean brought up, is, that is, is in broadcasting. There are very few major broadcast outlets, BBCs among them. Uh, uh, the PBS is still trying very hard, but the commercial outlets do very little science reporting or reporting of any kind. And, uh, and depend large, more and more on, uh, on uh, either spot news, which is rather shallow, or, uh, or just parroting what press releases say. Or it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a sad thing. But the, the agglomeration of news is hard to figure out right now. Things are in ferment. It's just a big bubbling stew pot, and nobody knows where it's going. Next to you. As scientific writers and researchers, how do you uh, reconcile confirmation bias in your writing. But just that idea that you know naturally you want to look for those things that support um, the ideas and principles you already hold or the research you already have, but at the same time not ignore those ones that might contradict it. What you do is you teach college classes. <laughs> if you want a critical audience, get a, get a bunch of 18-year-olds and, and wake them up against their will at 8 o'clock in the morning and try to teach them about human origins. You can, You'll get feedback very quickly. And if you make any mistakes, they'll be on it like that. And you know, I think as a, if you're a really good scientist, you're not going to let that influence okay. your work. My work stands for what it is. And there was, we were talking about when we were looking at bitter taste perception that we had this hypothesis that you know, there would be variability among populations with different diets. Didn't find it. We found completely the opposite. OK, now let's explore that. You know, why, why are we seeing that? Um, obser observation. I think where the where there is a major bias, and maybe the media people <laughs> can talk about it, it's also what the science editors are looking for. It is becoming increasingly difficult to get our our studies published. They want something that's going to get in the news. They want something that's going to uh, dispute a prior theory, or is going to contradict it, or um, you know they're setting the bar. Like if it's a negative result. Forget it. <laughs> you know, then you're going to be at the lowest tier journal. I mean, I do. I, I feel like there's a pressure, and what I worry about. I I know my own personal ethics, and that it's not going to change the way I do science. But there are a number of stories right now about people in the news, scientists who have altered their data, and I do worry that there's so much that it's not a justification, but there's a lot of pressure right now, getting very hard to get things published. Well, I know it's science that one of the criteria when they're looking at scientific manuscripts is how is this significant, this, this science finding? How will it change your field or impact your field? So, so researchers are asked when they're in a science or nature, not necessarily journals that are in the field, okay? Not the more specialized journals, but science or nature are generalized journals 
they are asked to talk about it. I mean, Tim, people who, Tim and Sarah recently published in Science, they could probably talk about it, so have you. I think I'll let you guys talk about that. That is part of it. But then there are the stories of the people, did any of you read about the Chemistry Nobel Prize? There was a great story in the New York Times two years ago uh, on, the, on the lattice, this Israeli scientist who came up with this, the lattice structure, and nobody believed him, but he kept with it. He just kept with it and kept with it, and eventually, it's a wonderful story because it had a happy ending. They don't all have happy endings, though, but. There's another aspect. I mean, there's a contrary trend. If, if the journals are looking for news, which is stories which are outliers, which change paradigms, which will make ink, at the same time, we happen to be in a society, and this is happening in Western Europe and Japan and most places, the funding agencies are, have ever smaller budgets. Fewer uh, grant applications are approved, and one suspects, one hears, this is way upstream from where it reaches me, that, that therefore the adventurous projects, those that are most clever and original, those that depart the most from the norm are, are having a harder and harder time getting uh, approved. So to some extent, the funding agencies for science are compelled, I think, just by budgets to somewhat restrict the ability of true diversity and legitimate research, while the journals are out there looking for the stuff that breaks the boundaries. And that's, that's a paradox, perhaps. And I don't know which one is dominating, whether the journals are actually still selecting more exciting, more exciting things or the raw material is getting a bit more um, uniform and perhaps bland. What I've seen a lot of within uh, the last, or growing over the last 10 years is what looks like increasingly conscious planning in press releases, planning in contacts with media, designed to excite research about a specific topic, to move it from the periphery to the center. Just in the choice of words sometimes, the way I bump into these things is I'll get a request from a journalist to comment on a story that has thus far not been released. It's a forthcoming paper in nature, forthcoming paper in science, and, and the, the the professional journalist will send me a copy of the paper and say, may I call you tomorrow and discuss this. Sometimes I'll get a cold call and, you know, I need, I'm on deadline by five o'clock, I need a reaction to, you know, Professor such and such has found the you know, oldest humans, they're, they're in South America seven million years ago, crazy stuff like this. What do you think? I, say, I don't know. <laughs> you sometimes see these press releases d designed to excite attention about a subject that objectively viewed doesn't deserve it. And so, so that's out there. I think the, the journals are also trying to excite, uh, excite interest in their circulation and, and the attention they get, how often the, the, the papers that are published in them are cited because that influences the citation indices of the journals, not science and nature because they're the top dogs, but you know, um, less important journals will try to magnify their findings by press releases. So there's, there's games afoot, you know, so to speak. You've been very patient. Um, this is for Dr. White and Dr. Shea. How do you decide that what you found is, I guess, significant? Because I know that there's just an extensive database of things that have been found. How do you go about comparing what you've found to everything that's been found? How do you know this is something new, this is relevant, this is authentic? Well, I, I try to do my job right. I don't question its authenticity. You know, I, I often try to check to make sure I'm not, again, confirmation bias. I'm not blind to an alternative interpretation of, of what I've found. Well, how do I decide it's really important? Well, I, if, if I've got money to do it, it's been judged to be important by the grant review committee. Or if the findings being accepted in the publication, it's been found to be important and pub worthy of publication by my peers. Um, but what I really, it's, it's the bottom line, I, I'm, when I'm, I'm thinking about what I'm doing, I'm, I'm evaluating it. I'm usually not sitting at my desk looking at papers. I'm usually crashing through the woods on my mountain bike. And I'll, I'll have these epiphanies, you know. I think, you know, I didn't think about it that way. And when I get one of those, those moments where, you know, gee, you know, that fact, this fact, those things I used to think of as insignificant, oh, those are really important. Those are like clues in a detective story. When I start seeing the, the same data with a, a very different perspective, that's when I say, that's yeah, a game changer. And I need to change my view of it. That happens not often, but when it does happen, you remember it. Uh, you know, if you're in the field, in a position to be able to provide new information, you should know the field. You should be pretty familiar with what the breadth of knowledge is, where the gaps are. 
And science is really curiosity driven, as I said in my talk. It's also question driven. So if you found something that answers a question that's new, the way that you communicate that is to publish it. Now, you're going to have people who hype it, and you're going to people, have people who downplay it. But depending on the size of that question, we rely on the journalistic community to make that call. That's why we have to have experienced journalists. So Charlie's been covering this science ever since Lucy. Lucy was a pretty big deal back in the 1970s. I remember meeting Charlie when I was a, a much younger professor at Berkeley. And the question that we had at the time was, what came before Lucy? And nobody in the world knew the answer to that. And so when we were able to go and find something that was older than Lucy and interpret it and, and publish it, we, we went through a process which was to convince the editors of the journal that this was important. And for them to be convinced, they wanted to go to other scientists to verify is that an important question? Is that really new? And so it's, it, it's, it's a built-in security system in a sense. The danger comes in the world of modern media, and I'd like to hear Charlie and Ann talk about this, where it, be, because of the 24-hour, or what is it now, the 12-hour news cycle, constant news, you've got a lot of pressure for these things to come out. Editors know that if they, could, if they take this story, it's going to be controversial, there's going to be a fight, there's a big claim, and they're, they're hesitant to put it through a real rigorous review process because the reviewers might say, you know, this, is, this really doesn't answer a big question. It's really not new. We should, you know, verify that, do, do more work, have it. So the editors are often making the call, and once the editor makes the call, especially with the big journals, it's going to be published in Nature, Science, Proceedings of the National Academy. The media are going to be there. The media, these, these folks are watching that. And so that's going to go. And what you don't see, I, I think, what the public doesn't see is the choreography, the background. Sarah talked earlier about the press release that's created. The university people, they want their university's name out there in the news. So while you're all getting up in the morning and reading the newspaper that day, two weeks ahead of time, we know that this paper is going to be published in a journal. Other people don't even know it for the most part. But it's all choreographed <laughs> for that 24-hour news cycle. Yeah, yeah. And there's, there's very little time for reflection. It goes back to the Stuart Brand comment that I started my lecture with. We're in this mass, mass uh, media world of, 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 of very, very low attention span and very in the moment kind of a thing. And in that environment, that's perfectly set up for hucksters, hypesters, and people who want to sell you their university, their channel, whatever it is. And that makes it really difficult for all of you and all of the public to make choices. Um, that's a very good question for the scientists and how they know what's important. Can I ask you a question, which is, when we first met, at one point, you said, you know, what I'm really interested in, as I recall, was pigs. He, this guy is not a, a, a paleoanthropologist so much as a pig, anth pig paleontologist. And during your talk today, you, you lit up in describing the efforts to come up with a full portrait of that time, of the time when Ardipithecus, the woodland, all the creatures, the little teeth, the big teeth, and the ankle bones. Do you feel a little bit, well, how hard is it for you to see that the news story here is still going to be us, going to be people? But in your soul of souls, are you more excited, perhaps, about those ankle bones from a, from a rhinoceros and no, all no, the no. rest let of me it? Tell, let me about, tell you about the pigs. <laughs> <laughs> now, with this arty in this woodland, I left this part out, and Charlie's absolutely right, and there's a very important point to this story. We have a little tiny pig that looks more like a peccary than anything See, else. Can you imagine likes in Africa? <laughs> we have other pigs that are that big, with third molars that big, huge pigs. The other thing that's really cool, we've got a giant bear about the size of a Kodiak bear living in that woodland. Wow. And we found its remains. 
but he's absolutely right. Nobody gives a damn about the bears and the <laughs> pigs and the dung beetles and all of that stuff. That's, as a biologist, that's what I want to know. That was my question. Yeah, uh -huh. Let's get into that world, recover those data. But I know darn well that the pigs and the bears and the pollen and all of that are not going to get me published in science, published in the New York Times and all the other stuff, not going to get Ann to write a story on that. Sorry. So, yeah, sorry, <laughs> see? So, so I know that. So I have a responsibility, not just to the, to the big paleontologists, but the pollen paleontologists, the plant paleontologists, and everything else, and as a scientist, to make sure that I can report that information to the scientific community, but also, since we're running in large part on either individual support or public support of this research, I have to follow what people are really interested in. If they're really interested in human ancestry, then I will do the best that I can to make that information available to the people who paid for it. That's important to the people who really want it. And so that's what we do. And we're, we're as scientists, we're in this very difficult situation. Uh, you know, we could call it the Carl Sagan effect. Carl Sagan was before most of your time, and he was this fantastic astronomer. He was routinely on, on, on the talk shows, and the night talk shows, did a great big TV series. Never elected to the National Academy of Science for his scientific work. The astronomy community was jealous of his public appeal. People tell us, oh, go, talk to the public. You know, bring science to the public. Do it responsibly. How are you going to do it without being on television? But as soon as you're on television, then people criticize you for being on television. You look, you're, you're a media hog. You're out to, so it's this, it's this balance. That's, where, that's what we find. So I, I tend to always go back to answer the question, back to the question. How, how important was that question? How, do, how does what I found advance our knowledge? And rely on the editors and the journalists to be the filters. And one, one thing more. that fits, oh, I'm sorry. One thing that fits with that is I've found researchers who consistently do really good work they know how to ask really good questions, okay? And this is important whether you're gonna be a scientist or a journalist. What stories I spend my time on? Where do you put your effort? I'm going to a genetics meeting next week that Sarah's gonna be at in Montreal. I'm getting email from people who want me to come look at their sequencing machines. Come to my party, come look at this, because they want me to write about it. That's, I'm gonna ignore that. That's not what I'm there for, okay? It's to find the people that are asking the really interesting ideas, maybe about pigs even, cannibal pigs maybe, but, but <laughs> whatever it is, it's finding the really good ideas. And then they sell themselves usually. If my editor has something they want me to do, if I have a better idea, I'll say, well, which one do you want me to do? They'll usually let me do my idea. So in everything in life, it's finding what ideas you put your time and energy into, whether it's research, stories. I mean, that's sort of one of the keys, I think. John, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I think also for scientists not to drive themselves insane on this point is that uh, there's also this element of time. You know, all of us are, are wired to be skeptical, not cynical, but skeptical of the first report of something. You know, really? Is that it? Et cetera, et cetera. And so often a paper catches us by surprise. We may not know what's in the pipeline. We read it in the journal. Like, well, it's going to take some time to digest that. It may take some time for some follow-up work, either by the same investigators or by some of their colleagues, et cetera. So I don't, I, one thing I'm just a little concerned about is we get the idea that, you know, the paper's published, and the news cycle happens, and that's what we then know. Now, there's this other element of time of, of when the dust settles, when the follow-up work is done, when other people have joined that work. And that's when you start talking about the material that's going to make its way into textbooks, into curricula, start to become really the accepted consensus body of knowledge that you know, we consider you know, worthy of, of, of being in, in the educational system. So um, I would just sort of say there's, there's different half-lives of sort of the um, you know, in, in this process. And there's a very long uh, process of, the, of sort of the, the settling in of this, where, you know, great ideas and great discoveries, it, it, it's, it's often the case they're just not recognized. Anne was giving an the example. They're just not recognized at, at the moment they happen. And that's not even necessary jealousy or anything. It just really hasn't had enough time to sink in and see all the dimensions of something. One more question. Oh, you can only, might we put it up for auction? Is that what we should do? We're going to go over here. I know you've been waiting very patiently. We've seen throughout history that it's very difficult to change people's mindsets. I mean, it took years for people to take the heliocentric model or any like new upending 
convention. So I know it takes time to change those mindsets, but how can we get the audience to be open sooner or quicker? Great point. Hmm. That's why we're not yeah. educators. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, think, I think it's education is yeah, the primary place. Yeah. The, the, the other is that we have these cultural conflicts. It's in, incumbent in, on uh, educators and journalists alike not to explain that if you're writing about, about uh, uh, ch climate change or about evolution or something else that people don't want to hear about, to be sure that you're, you're not saying, tell people what they have to believe. I mean, a teacher shouldn't, a parent shouldn't have to worry that their child goes off to the public school and be told that their family's church is wrong. Uh, but they should be told there are many stories t that are being told. And education is to know lots of stories. There are stories in scripture. There are stories in philosophy. There are a lot of stories uh, which you may choose to believe. But you should also know what the story is that is in, the, is, is in starlight, is in the stones and the bones. And, and you should be able to you should understand it. You should be able to pass tests on it, even if you don't believe it. And I, I think a lot of these cultural conflicts are unnecessary. And it's partly from, um, well, I think truth is definitely on the side of science. There is an arrogance when people want to just tell someone that, well, you're just wrong. And uh, you shouldn't tell your children that. It's, it, it's divisive. Uh, and there's no real easy fix for it. You know, it's, it's going to take generations. It may never happen. There's also got to be room for failure, for errors. I mean, that is how science works. People make mistakes. You don't get it right and not have somebody crucified because they interpreted their data wrong. I think there has to be room for that process, and I worry about that a little bit these days, too. Um, I think it's important to show this is an ongoing process. Thank goodness. That means you're all needed. You're needed as citizens, you're needed as readers, you're needed as thinkers, you're needed as educators, you're needed as future scientists. Thanks for participating in the discussion. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.